Hi, I'm Jay, and surprisingly, I'm here! I'm alive! I exist! Uh, I know it's been a minute. Sorry for leaving the channel barren for three months and coming back with whatever this is. Um, so what you're about to hear is the first episode of a podcast that my friend Kirsten Meehan and I uh, started recently called The Marmoset Chronicles, a personal retrospective which is a podcast about a definitely real series of extremely influential movies from the 70s that just really influenced every aspect of pop culture you could possibly think of for the decades since. Uh, that definitely really happened and definitely is not being improv by us on the fly over the course of a set of episodes. That would be f fucking crazy. Who would do that? The fuck would do that? Uh, so I said it would be fun to just sort of put the first episode out here on YouTube as a little hook for you. Uh, if you like what you've heard, it is on iTunes and Google Play and Spotify and wherever you download podcasts. Uh, and it's part of the Orange Groves Network. Um, our friends who do shows like Got It Memorized and the artist formerly known as Bed Bath & Bionicle. Bunch of other shows on there. Uh, really happy to be on the network. Thank you so much to Joe and everyone there for getting us on there. Uh, if you're watching this and wondering where the hell have you been? I do have a new Longest License Voyage still on the way. The Golden Compass video is coming soon. I have it written. I just need to edit it. Um, it's been a weird few months, and I'll probably make another video talking about... I, I might... I might. This channel is not ceasing to be a thing I'm doing, um, but the podcast has been a really fun thing to put work into in the last few weeks. I have also kind of been reevaluating what kind of stuff I want to do here on the channel, so that next Longest License Voyage is coming. And then uh, we're going to talk. We're going we're gonna to talk about what, what's next. I've also been uh, doing a little bit of Twitch streaming as the uh, the coronavirus quarantine is kind of... Not, not hard quarantine me into effect here in upstate New York where I live, but uh, I have been working from home and that's given me some extra time to screw around with stuff and I have started streaming. So you can find me at uh, twitch.tv slash extreme salsing for a Nuzlocke run I'm doing of Pokemon Moe Mon Emerald, which is a strange uh, ROM hack I'm not sure how I feel about. Um, I'll probably be putting some, like, highlights from that up on the channel, too. And, I, yeah, I, I could get more into, you know, thoughts about what's next for the channel, and I'll do that. But for now, enjoy the episode, The Marmoset Chronicles. The Marmoset Chronicles, the eight-movie epic by writer and director Laz Patillo, is a touchstone of modern film and pop culture. From the moment its first movie hit screens in 1970 to this very day, it has inspired, innovated, puzzled, and been the true vanguard for the kind of hard-hitting stories that only film can tell. We don't need to tell you what it's about. You already know what it's about. Even if you've never seen the movies, you've seen the homages, the parodies, and the rip-offs. There's almost no point to doing this podcast retrospective because there has been so much scholarship written about this film series. It almost created a new kind of film criticism, and we'll be referencing some of that. But these films were so important to us as storytellers and us as people that we had to try. So, hi, I'm Kirsten. And I'm Jay. How you doing, Kirsten? You ready to go through the, uh, the libraries of some of the most, almost redundantly influential film of all time? Oh god, this, like... I guess to kind of give these guys a peek behind the curtain before the curtain's even already all the way up. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about whether it was even worth it to do this. Yeah, movie. I mean, like, good God. You, you, you can only watch so many series of video essays, like, breaking down these movies one by one and bit by bit. You can only, you know, there's already a bunch of podcasts about it. There is, like, yeah, th this is a thing... That when you say, oh, I'm discussing this thing, you might almost get laughed at. Not because it's not a thing that's revered, because it's a thing that's so revered that it's been talked out of the room and back again. It's ad like nauseum doing, forever. It's like doing your English thesis on Keats. Like, it's been done. Right. Um, when kind of the, the way that we justified this is that, so we're not really going to do a lot of plot analysis. We're not going to do a lot of cinematography um, analysis. This is really going to be a podcast about how this these movies affected us as people and us as creators. And uh, because that's sort of the only way we can be new and fresh about it uh, is be to talk about how these movies 
personally affected us. Right. And, and, you know, also to admit that that doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? Like we will, you know, you, you can't talk about why, you know, th- there is a lot, I, I know at least for me, <laughs> by that same token, there's a lot about how these movies influenced me where I do have to talk about scenes or about stuff that happened with the director or behind course, the scenes, you know, stuff that came out in interviews, what have you. Um, oh, yeah, I, yeah. I know for me, and we'll get into this, but I know for me, my fandom of them as a kid was as much entrenched in a lot of that ancillary stuff mm-hmm. or the stuff mm-hmm. around the center as it was in the movies itself. Oh yes. And I, I'm, uh, I think I might've uh, maybe uh, been a little bit concrete in my language there. It's not that we're not going to be talking about that, but this is not a scholarly analysis of right. the Marmoset Chronicles. This exactly. is this is um sort of this is kind of about um two people who grew up in a post Marm um Marmoset Chronicles world. Um, yeah, exactly. Because it, it, because they are so influential and they are so they are so important to people's lives. Um for me I'm not particularly close to my family. We, we, we just have never been a very tight knit group of people. Um, I, um, I, I know a lot of people have these experiences where their, um, their parents sort of pass down their interests to them. Like people whose like um, parents sat down and showed them star Wars or star Trek or mm-hmm. um, whose parents really passed on their music taste. I, I got none of that. I didn't listen to the Beatles until I was like 17. <laughs> because <laughs> just Nobody showed it to me. Uh, but this is the one piece of pop culture that my father showed to me. And we, we wow. sat down um, one, one it, it, Oh God. It was like the week of Christmas when I was like, uh, seven maybe so which is kind of early for these movies but uh he had the whole week off work and he just showed me all the movies and that was a that is a very important memory to me and that's part of the reason why i love them so much is because th- they were directly passed down to me like that mm-hmm. he, he showed you all of them yes he showed me all of them wow i uh that, that's interesting i um did, did he he like own them all were they all on your movie shelf when you were growing up or did he have to like oh. go find them from a rental store no, I I think he I think he had the uh the videotape box set. Ah, oh, nice. Yep. Okay. Um, I had so this is so you and I are connected in that neither of us had a lot of uh, media income with our, our parents, right? Like like what you just described is kind of true for me too. My parents, my, my my dad will tell you will spend twenty minutes telling you why he thinks Star Wars is dumb, and really it comes down to that there isn't enough like legal thrill in it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, just uh, if John Grisham had written Star Wars, let me tell you, this would be a very different conversation. Um, <laughs> I would be in that universe. I know. Fucking get JJ out of here and get Grisham in there. Anyway, <laughs> that's just a good idea. Let's start a second podcast about that. But um, but no. So that was not my entry point, right? They didn't care about Star Wars. They didn't care about. I don't know, like Lord of the Rings, they didn't care about Marmoset Chronicles. They didn't care about any popular movies like that of newer or older. Um, where it came from was the AV club at my middle school uh, originally. Oh, okay. So Who are other kids? What? Well, yeah. Um, well, it was through a teacher and other mm-hmm. kids. Um, okay. This teacher, it was a small school. I grew up in a small town. So it was the same teacher ran this little AV club in the middle school and a bit of a bigger one in the high school, just because there weren't really any other teachers in the school system who were as well versed in that stuff as he was. And so he kind of just ran both. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a huge Marmoset Chronicles fan. So like, I, I never saw growing up that VHS box set that you were talking about altogether, but I would see whichever tape of it he had pulled out to bring to the school that day for us to watch. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, and then he also had like, a, it, it was, you know, it had like the couple extra cassette. I, I love this from before DVDs when it was each tape had special features just mm-hmm. after the mm-hmm. movie. Um, and then there was another, at least one other VHS of just more special features and like making wow. of stuff. Oh God! Did he? Uh, did he have that one poster up? I'm like imagining this AV room now. Did he have that one poster up? The one that everybody had? Oh, of course, with the sun setting in the background. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The iconic slide in in profile. Yeah, it's it's it's. Um, you know, I. <laughs> so not only did he have that, um, when we were all seniors, 
we pitched in to find and get him a giant movie theater promotional sized one of it. Cause remember what, when the last movie came out, they could, cause that, that original poster is art from the first one, but they yeah, sort of yeah. did a redone version of it for the final one with like, you know, kind of all the characters we'd met along the way and all that kind of stuff. It was oh. like, it was mirroring that original poster. We got him uh, a movie theater about 60 miles outside of the town. Oh. That, like the one of us with a car just drove us to, um, they had they like we were just calling around to theaters and they were like oh yeah we've got a moth eaten one of those giant posters for it in the back somewhere do you want it and we were like yes and we we like paid just a bunch of money from our summer jobs to chip in and get it for him because we loved this teacher so much that's incredible uh, so he was yeah Mr Matthews he was a really good teacher but so yeah he 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 loved those movies and not only did he love them he would always show us those special features those behind the scenes things right so really like I grew up with every, like I was saying I grew up with everything around the movies as much as the movies he even brought yeah. in uh there were the comics that were pretty short-lived that DC published in like oh god in, in like 79 for a little bit oh, he even brought some of those cool. in I there's guess it would have been more like 75. Th there was that whole um, like legal issues where they couldn't get the uh, the main actors, like they couldn't get the rights to use the, oh the main God. actors like yep. likeness. Yep. So, they just, so they just focused on these random and still um, uh, background characters. These background characters, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I I've actually never read those. Um, I know Shock of Shocks. I, I read a lot of DC comics and I really love these movies. I never read those comics but i um I, I have heard that they do some fun little like world building things but not enough to yeah. keep the comic running I, I mean dc publishes a lot of stuff you'd be surprised by dc published all the bionicle comics that's a true fact um oh, wait, wait 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 do you hear that it's the sound of everybody gasping in shock because jay just brought up bionicle <laughs> i have to do it once an episode i have to do it in everything i do <laughs> that's that's not true if i did that i don't uh burn um, out um if, if you guys are unfamiliar with the work of jay uh jay is like the world's only um hyper bionicle fan that's not true jay there's at least bionicle five or lore. six of us you know that there's bionicle lore i found out that there was bionicle lore last week <laughs> i can tell you about bionicle lore anytime i know it all man we're not talking about bionicle lore. We're talking yeah about that, this bionicle is not the bio this is not the uh the toa nuva chronicles you know if we if we did like some really intense like six degrees of separation we probably could connect the marmoset chronicles to bionicle well dc comics we just figured it out oh, like that God. that's it uh, but yeah this that that's another thing these movies are so are such touchstones that everything is influenced by them. Yeah. Pop culture does not make sense if you take out these movies. They just don't. Exactly. I mean, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's... <laughs> It, it, it's so funny that like th there's stuff spoiled in these movies that's just as common as, you know, Luke, I am your father or as... I can't think of any other big... Or, or, or as Ro Rosebud is the sled or anything else. Yeah. It is just... Like, there's stuff in this, there are moments that are just right up there, you know? And, you know, even if it's, even, you know, taking away, like, the direct, like, parodies, like, getting rid of all of the, you know, stupid Simpsons gags and the, um, that one really ill-thought-out episode of How I Met Your Mother. Oh, um, Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't like that show, so, like. I don't need. <laughs> um, but I have seen that episode and I, I am not happy with it. Um, yeah, I mean, my dad does like that show and does not like that episode because of how much he likes these movies. Um, or like the, or, you know, the, the, one of the characters from big bang theory has a tattoo of something from this show on, on, uh, on but, his arm, but even just counting all of that, even like you see scenes in movies and you're like, wow, it's gorgeous. And it's gorgeous because the Marmoset Chronicles did it first. Right, yeah, exactly. That and it, it was such a it, it's, god, they're not perfect movies either. And I love them mm. even more because they're not perfect movies. And well, there's I, I eight think, of them, you know, like that's it's yeah. never gonna like you, you, you watch all uh, <laughs> have you watched all eight Nightmare on Elm Street movies? Um, no, Good. I watched maybe four. Okay, well, even then with four, like th that's weirdly kind of always my prime litmus test. Cause I think that is one of the most fascinating series in how it goes from the first one demanding to be taken seriously as a horror film to at least the back five of them just being slapstick comedy with murder. And it's like that kind of change happens over any long series. You know, Fast and the Furious is big now. Ch that kind of change happens with those movies. 
There's mm-hmm. eight of the Marmoset Chronicles movies. It's going to happen there too. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's something we talked about. Absolutely. And yeah. celebrated, I think. Yeah. Um, because even like. Change is good. Yeah. And even something that's pretty, pretty close to perfect. Um, it, there are, you know, flaws in it. Yeah. Let, let me ask you this. And I know we, we said we weren't going to get academically into this and we won't. But do, do you feel like for you, these movies are close to perfect? Um, oh God. Cause I have some that I do and we're going to get into this in their uh-huh. respective episodes, but like I have as many that do, I, I think I'm kind of four and four on which ones are perfect and which ones are severely flawed. And I love them all collectively, of course, but uh-huh. it's very hard for me to really like separate. It, it's hard for me to think of them collectively and not individually, I guess. So, um, I think as as a collective, as one story arc spanning eight movies, I think that overarching story is pretty close to perfect. Mm-hmm. And I think that there are moments in the middle of them that are absolutely not perfect. Sure, that's valid. Um, but that those those beginning and ending scenes and just the perfect like p- parenthetical symmetry of them and how we um and and where Georgie starts and then where he ends up. Mm-hmm. and that's that is just archetypically beautiful that is yeah. that is just narrative and yeah. i'm i'm the i just said the word narrative and i did a little bit of jazz hands because like <laughs> because i i'm um i'm someone who you know would uh skip my um science classes to go sit in on other english classes in college so um that's the kind of shit i like <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, you did do that too because I was in one of those English classes once, and I yeah. saw you sneak in through the back door. I was like, "Oh, hey, yeah, yeah, this is was... weird. Why are you here? Yeah, I it's definitely... good to see you, but why are you here? I definitely should have been um, in human biology for non majors, but I wanted to hear you all talk about the Pilgrim's Progress instead. Oh, and we did, but yeah, um. But yeah, I, I, I think I, I, I think you're right that you do have to appreciate this as a, you know, almost as if it's a giant eight act single movie rather than yeah. eight individual movies. And that's that's something that I, I still struggle with a little bit because of those highs and lows. Mm-hmm. Um, well, when, when we get to the fifth one, I think the fifth like five is the one that. Ooh, five's real divisive. Well, five's the one where he had a co-director, right? So, like, he oh, tried yeah. that. It didn't work. He never did it again in these movies or, you know, any of the other few projects he ever did. Yeah. So, like, that's its own whole topic. We'll get to that when we get to it. But, yeah, I, I think they're really interesting to disassemble. But I do think you're right, ultimately, that you do kind of have to look at it. Yeah. as a collective movement you know and you know this is like the first movie that ever really did that because there were yeah. definitely sequels um before these movies came out but the idea of spending over a decade telling one story mm-hmm. that was that had never i mean that, like now it's still you know people people thought it wouldn't happen with with marvel but probably one of the reasons it did happen with marvel is because the Marmoset Chronicles laid down some of the tracks, some of the flip. And that's a yeah. very different situation. That's, you know, eight movies versus 22 or however many are in Marvel, but still they kind of, he kind of laid down the tracks yeah. of how to manage that over that much time and keep fans interested. And by God, Laz made eight of the damn things. And yeah. now here we are talking about it in 2020. I think it's even more impressive that La- that, that, that Patillo did it because mm-hmm. um, like Marvel movies, they have, you know, the fact that they're backed by all the money in the world and the yeah. fact that it's, it's, it's comics, it's their franchise. You're going yeah. off of characters people know and recognize and love. And you're, mm-hmm. they had, you know, every big name actor in the world has been in the Marvel movies. And, you know, it was a very different time. It was a very different place to be making movies, a different space sure. in, oh, yeah. in the 70s and 80s. They had much less of a budget. They had less, much less people believing in them. I mean, how many how many like actual name actors are in are in the Marmoset Chronicles? Like what maybe oh. four? Maybe? Yeah, and, and most of them are fairly minor roles. I um th- there's a couple more weight major ones that have major roles that they bring in the last couple, only because I think they were a little more, more worried about like declining sales by the last couple uh, of the studio. I mean, but yeah. 
in those first few, you have what? You have that one really oh, weird young Christopher Walken cameo. Yeah, yeah he's in there. He, I mean, he's in there for about for about ten seconds, but he is there. Yeah, um, yeah. It's all it's all background ones like that. It's him and um, fuck, what is her name? Hold on, IMDb, help me out here. Jessica Walter, young Jessica Walter is in there. Like you know, I, four, thirty. I, oh, yeah, fuck, she is. Yeah, she's like um, shit. How old is Jessica? I guess she would have been in like her twenties or thirties. She's like um, she's just in a store that someone goes into and i think the second one she's just like the clerk in the uh you know it, it's when it's it's right before the gunfight breaks out at the, at the uh not walgreens at like the right aid in the yeah. second one she's the clerk there and she's you don't see her face much so you wouldn't know but that is a younger jessica walters yeah weird very yeah. weird yeah there's uh these movies are just they're not really they're not movies i watch a lot these, this is definitely not like, you know, I have the flu and I want to watch something that I'll, I'll definitely love. They're not one of those movies, but they are movies I've rewatched a lot. And I just, I always find something new every time I go into them. It's incredible, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, that's a thing too, is that I would say all eight of them do that. And the fact that all eight of them kind of have that power over you mm -hmm. is fucking like we impressive and also just weird a little bit uh listen las patillo had some sort of magic going on and he's never he hasn't been able to capture it since and he wasn't yeah. able to catch, capture it before uh there's a reason that you only really know this man for these movies and it's not even because of all the weird interpersonal drama that happened it's not because of all the fights he had with the mm -hmm. studios it's just because he he was never this good again yeah yeah, or, or before, like, like there's a couple short films he made before this that are, aren't really there either. And like, yeah, there's there's a reason that after this he kind of just faded away and moved out to. Do we even know where he lives? It's like somewhere in the Netherlands, maybe. But then some people say Czechoslovakia. I had heard, like, I had heard it varies. The mm -hmm. I had heard Latvia, but um, I think he moves around a lot. I think he doesn't yeah. really want anyone to know who he is. I think he realizes that part of the reason he's still relevant at all is that mystique that he has it's that he's the guy no one sure. can get an interview with yeah i guess to sort of move this right along um we also wanted to talk about like this effect on like you know kind of collective narrative that this these movies did but also how they affected sort of us as storytellers because in case you haven't been able to tell by you know just how we've been talking up to this point uh jay is a writer yep I am also a writer. Writer, right? I, I think I think we're both writers and critics, right? Like, like not super published, but like we we, we both think very critically about this yes, kind yes. of thing. Yes. Um, to give you just kind of an idea, um, both um, Jay and I met in college in the same writing program, um, and then connected through our school newspaper to just sort of give us give you you all some background on how we think and how we came to meet each other. So. We and you know anything we, that we've consumed as much as th these movies are going to affect us. You know the way we con conceptualize stories. Absolutely, um, anything at all, right? Like whether yeah. yeah, whether it's a movie or you know you, you and I also bonded over the fact that we both like Homestuck a lot, and that's a oh God. strange we're thing to break gonna, down and talk about. No, we're gonna we're gonna not gonna ruin our credibility by talking about the fact that we've both put way too much time and energy in our lives thinking about that webcomic. You're right. We'll um, find a different way to ruin our credibility. No, I, I already ruined your credibility by telling them about the Bionicle thing. I already brought Bionicle! I brought Bionicle up willingly, and you know it. <laughs> but anyway. Fucking Christ. Anyway, yeah. Uh, it was, this was definitely a touchstone in me, like, realizing how stories are told. Another, um, I kind of, I kind of considered this, um, and uh, here, speaking of ruining our credi my credibility, uh, this and Digimon, one of the seasons of Digimon, were really instrumental in my me realizing kind of how stories are told and how you use characters to make a point. Was it uh, season three? Is that Tamers? Uh, yes and no. It, it was Tamers for um, sort of overarching plot and how to use arc, like yeah. plot arc. Um, sure. But I learned character arc in the second season. Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. That makes With sense. The, uh, the Emperor stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a fucking good character. Wow. 
Oh, hell yeah. But that, that really, that, t- that showed me how to like, how you can use a redemption arc well. And sure. Um, the, um, and the Marmoset Chronicles really showed me character connection. And how mm-hmm. character connection builds plot, and then plot turns around and builds more character connections. Because that like spiraling web of people Georgie comes in contact with mm-hmm. is, I think, the heart and soul of this series. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's it, it's both when it's people he's just met or is just being introduced to, and when it's him kind of getting back in contact with his family a little bit after that's mm-hmm. like that becomes a plot oh, point because that not hurts just my a- heart so much everything between georgie and his biological family oh my god in three like holy ass uh, oh well, yeah um three makes me ball like a baby fuck jesus the entire everything that happens in their backyard one they're gonna need a new backyard oh. by the end of but two yeah it's just it's just so emotional that that oh. we'll, we'll get to it three has my favorite set pieces of any of them. And well, that, that's another thing actually. So what you just said about like the way he interacts with the people around him, I think the same can be said for the way setting is used in these movies because uh-huh. like th- th- they are so well constructed in giving you these set pieces that not only do you remember and recognize, you know, like, like as little as the Rite Aid where the shootout is that I was talking about before, or it's one as iconic as his family's house where a lot of chunks of three take place and a couple of the mm-hmm. other ones take place um, or parts of them do like those places also have personality to them. That oh, changes yeah. as if it's the personality of a person. And you know, me- oh. media does this right. But like, it's really good. To s- it, it, I really like <sighs> in only almost every big series of movies, the only exception I can think of is really kind of like Harry Potter. Most big series of movies have this obligation to constantly be moving around to new sets, new locations, which makes sense from a filmmaking perspective. You want to show people something new in terms of setting and location as much as anything. The things they continually go back to in these movies are so visually striking because they go back to them over the course of, you know, what does the old bar Georgie used to go to when he was 18 look like fucking eight years later when he's, coming in to meet up with some old friends, one of whom may want to kill him. Like, it's such a different... You see the vibe change as time passes, and that's really beautiful. And, like, there's a reason that um, Wes Anderson talks about Patillo as such a huge influence, and you can see it in his sets. Uh, Yeah, oh, sure. But but Patillo doesn't do the, like, you know, hyper-focused symmetry that Wes Anderson does. That's all Wes, yeah. Uh, Well, yeah, no, nobody can make a Wes Anderson movie like Wes Anderson. Um, But that idea that your setting needs to needs to be a character mm-hmm. right exactly yeah that was really that is something that that these movies really c- cemented and you know obviously it was done before movies existed before these movies even if it doesn't really feel like they did but this there's a reason that you know this is the director people talk about when they're talking about that point yeah the um the wes anderson thing is a really good example um Yeah, God, I mean, you hear directors talk about this guy. I mean, fucking Hayao Miyazaki has spoken favorably about Laz Patillo, and Hayao Miyazaki doesn't really like anyone. He doesn't even like himself. He doesn't like his own movies. He he is the most, like, insular person on planet Earth, the most, you know, turtle hiding from the world at the end of the day. Hayao Miyazaki is incredible and a great mind and has created some of my favorite movies of all time. He also clearly doesn't really like people sometimes is is what I'm getting at. Yeah, that's fair. But, uh, but yeah, even he has spoken very favorably of Las Patillo. Like he he's, I don't know. It's, it's really, it's really interesting how he's, how he manages to do that. Um, and you know, this in- the influence of these movies spans genres and decades and generation gaps and countries and language barriers. There's so many reasons. There's so many ways that this movie connects people. This is a movie that at the height of the Cold War put an entire five minute scene in unsubtitled Russian. Yeah. In- what? <laughs> Yeah, I know that. Uh, do you remember? And, and, like, and, <laughs> and that was not without some consequence. Like, I don't know if it was ever confirmed, but there were rumors that like the U.S. government was looking into Patillo as like a potential secret Russian oh, agent because he no. did that. That was a real. 
I, oh. I I do think I do think Hollywood tried to blacklist him. I do think that's part of the reason why Probably. he was so exiled from um, Hollywood and why um, there was so much studio meddling in his uh, movies after that because yeah. Uh, of that one one scene but god damn does that scene hit hard and it, it, it's a good scene in context and out of context yeah um wow there we just obviously we have a really big pie to deal with with this story uh, <laughs> and it's got like it's got like several different pies in it it's like each slice just is naturally a different kind of fruit they're just carefully all arranged in there in wedge shapes Right, I would have gone with a turducken, but we can do <laughs> pieception too. There we go. Tur- you know, maybe there's a turducken in the pie. That's that's also oh, a possibility. Huh. Any more thoughts on these movies as like general movies? <sighs> sure. I mean, o- always yes. Right is the thing yeah. is that the answer is never going to be no. Um, but in terms of what we're talking about here, like I think we've covered a lot of ground. Like, like for me. So what's fascinating about those um, behind the scenes things that I was talking about on those VHSs that I saw growing up a lot when I was watching these movies is how little Laz is even in them. Like, you know, he famously hates being interviewed, um, hates being on camera to him. It, like there's people who talk about him almost having a phobia of being on camera himself. Mm. Um, never tried acting, always knew he wanted to be the writer and director on the other side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, So he's almost never even in there, but I always just think about the way in which the actors interviewed in those uh, special features talk about working with him. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's reverent, but not in the rev in reverent in the way of like, let's say your favorite author knocked on your door tomorrow and said, Hey, I want to co-write a book with you. You would have a heart attack but once you recovered you would work with them in a state of perpetual reverence theirs was like the kind of reverence you'd have for a really venerable old relative in your family that mm-hmm. everyone loved and knew would probably pass away at some point in the next few years but everyone just cherished every bit of wisdom from their long long yeah. long life like Laz wasn't even Laz Patillo was in his late twenties when he made the first one of these. He wasn't that old, but he had that venerable quality to him yeah. in a like cosmic way where you can tell it's there from the way everyone on the set of those movies from beginning to end, from one to eight, talks about him. Yeah. And I I feel like every interviewer has tried to get like to the core of why. And I, I'm not going to try and get to the core of why, but I am going to keep asking why, right? Like yeah. if, if, if we want to set one thing in this first episode, I guess for me, it's like, what questions am I kind of asking about my own love of these movies going in uh, mm-hmm. to revisiting them with you? I, I'm going to be rewatching them as we talk about them. I think we yeah. both are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, like what, what lens, what what literary theory or whatever am I looking at these in, in this particular viewing? And I think one way I'm looking at them is asking the question, what defines that quality for that director? Yeah. What in this vision were they seeing while they were making it that made them grow as close to that director as so many people do who just watching the movies feel to that director now, decades later? Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah, and I think that's a good way to look at this whole um, this whole exercise. If you're looking at that, I'm kind of um, I'm sort of using this as as almost a thought exercise of what what would the world be like without these movies? Mm, um, okay, yeah. I, I'm really focusing on sort of canon here, both personal and film. How many things did this movie start? How, how many how many people had their first date watching movie one who were uh, <laughs> married by movie eight? Um, <laughs> because the because that that's kind of like what these what these movies were to a lot of people because that you know uh, seventy to eighty six eighty seven something like that eighty six I think 86? yeah um yeah. that was not that was a turbulent time in the world Um, absolutely and these these movies were touchstones these movies were something to look forward to when you know everybody was thinking a lot about nuclear holocaust and right yeah and and you can and and i think it's also important and and something that i think a lot of a lot of 
movies and media have have lost these days is that even when it's making really sharp social commentary it mm -hmm. never kind of drowns in its own darkness yeah exactly what you're talking about there with it being i, I would say maybe like a, a a form of safety from those fears of war and from nuclear demise um nuclear demise excuse me um lindsay ellis the youtuber has a really excellent old series of video essays about Lord of the Rings and how Lord of the Rings, the first one came out like right after 9-11. And uh, that was such a big reason that they caught on is because people were in such a fearful time then in 2001 that this very fundamental story or what on the mm -hmm. surface was a very fundamental story about good versus evil mm -hmm. was kind of similarly an escape for them. Yeah. I, and, and I'm not the first person to say this, whatever ground that whatever leg that argument has to stand on a big part of it is because the marmoset chronicles was able to do that for the cult periods of the cold war and all these yeah. other you know, all these other things back in its day mm -hmm. and um yeah and yeah. <laughs> basically and it, it was it's a it's a it was a big part of my life it was a big part of jay's life um to sort of kind of end this on um a personal anecdote that we share um mm -hmm. As I, as, as I mentioned, um, Jay and I really met and bonded in our school's newspaper and sort of the whole staff. The, our, our, school, our college newspaper was very small, very disorganized, <laughs> very much held together by spite and the skin of our teeth. So yep. we pulled some long nights in there. And I remember it was <laughs> us sitting in there with three other people. You know exactly yeah. the three other people we were talking about. I, I do. I'll, I won't say their names to protect no. the innocent. But um, there are, there were several things that would come up every single time we really got on a roll, and it would be um, Superman. <laughs> yep. Is Superman lame? Mm -hmm. It would be um, are the Star Wars prequels good? Mm -hmm. um, and it would be the Marmoset Chronicles. And we yeah. spent oh, yeah, always. so much time in that office screaming about these movies, and we were screaming because we were exhausted, and you know we were college students who were. <laughs> Still at on campus at ten thirty at night, we were running off Red Bull and Spite, we were because we had a lot of we have a lot of feelings about these movies, and so did yeah. the other three people. And sometimes um, it was sometimes it was the perfect distraction from fucking spending your eighth hour of laying out a fucking page and proofreading everything on a bunch of PDFs. Not gonna, we're not going to go back there right now, Jay. No, we're not. We're not. That was all I was going to say, and I said it. I said my fucking piece. Yes, but that was and um. It's it brought people together in yeah. the seventies and it's bringing people together now. And yeah. uh, I'm really excited to try and leave my mark on these movies. Uh, yeah, me too. All right. Is there anything else we need to kind of say to wrap this up? That's all I've got. I kind of just wanted to get my my sort of like not thesis, but yeah, my my kind of like investigative angle on this, like where yeah. I'm coming from with these movies. I, I think. I think this is an intro episode. It's good if we just both tell listeners where we are individually coming from. Yeah. And, and we've think, done that. I think we've done that. Um, yeah. uh, do you have any parting wisdom? Any parting wisdom? Uh, fa -ba 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 -ba. Um, my, my wisdom, if you want to see wisdom from me, you can find it on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> At Extreme Sol saying there's very little wisdom there. It's mostly just me tweeting dumb sentences that have come into my head and plugging my plugging my friends podcasts and this one now uh and also plugging my youtube channel which you can find uh if you search hi i'm jay on youtube i do some looks at uh licensed video games that no one has probably ever talked about before and trying mm -hmm. to find something good in them actually this is uh <laughs> speaking of of movie series this one wasn't a series but uh there is a game based on the Golden Compass movie that I'm currently working on a video on that might be oh out when this goes out, depending on when. Oh god! But yeah, that's where you can find me on the internet. Do you have you have a, an online presence you would like to share of any kind? Um, not right now. I might in the future. Um, I'm pretty invisible on social media right now. Um, as uh, most most of my accounts are either very small or very private. Um, but in the future, I might have um some stuff if hey if you want to read some of my bad poetry you can go i'm on instagram at kirsten me and writes it's really uh, good poetry is the thing about it we're not but we're not talking about um not, we're not going to talk about my poetry right now but, i know um, let me let me hype man for you for christ's sake <laughs> um but i think um i think that's a good place to leave it um 
Yeah. Please join us next week. Maybe? Next sa- same Marmoset time, same Marmoset channel. Is that That's- anything? Uh, and we will for our deep dive into everything about um the first movie in this series. Um Mm-mm. I'm ready. Do you feel ready? I am ready. I am very, very, very ready to talk about the Phantom and the Wren. Um probably the one I've gone back to the most. Oh um, yeah. So Absolutely. we will we will leave uh we will leave off our, our, our viewers the same way. Um uh, Georgie leaves off that first movie by uh, scuffing his his uh, his sneakers in the dirt and um, moving right along. So Just walking on into the sunset. Yes, and we will see you soon. See you soon. <laughs> <laughs>